more and more people are deciding church isn't for them. They just don't see the point. It's not hard to see why. It's a sin not to be this light has come to earth. You're walking right through the gates of hell. Ever found yourself thinking we'd all be better off without religion? Here's the crazy part. Jesus agrees with you. Losing my religion. It's so great to see you guys. Uh, for those of you who are new, my name is Moses Camacho. I'm the senior pastor of South Hills Church. Uh, we are one church, many locations, which means we have eight locations in Southern California. We have three locations out of California. And then we also have a global campus in Kenya. And so uh, if you enjoy your experience today and you happen to move to Kenya, we have you covered, okay? And so and if you happen to move to Virginia and Ohio and uh, where's the other campus? Idaho. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Wes has heard this spiel multiple times. He can do it for me now. So uh, we're glad you're here. And uh, we, dive, we dove into the series called Losing My Religion. Um, the reason why we did this is because a couple of weeks ago uh, we had our Easter Sunday and our Easter Sunday story was the story of Jesus Christ and why he came into this world and how he lived his life and how he gave his life on the cross and how he conquered death and he resurrected and uh, and ultimately what that story represents. And so uh, we, we jumped into this series called Losing My Religion because it really is a continuation of the Jesus story. And the big part of that is that Jesus, the reason why he even went to the cross is because of he upset quite a few religious leaders. And the reason why he upset religious leaders is because he was letting them know they were doing it all wrong. And so if you're a religious leader, this is your identity and this is what you live by. And all of a sudden you have this, this Jesus person that's telling you you're doing it all wrong and you're, you're communicating the wrong uh, word of God. And obviously they were very upset about that. And so one of the things I love about Jesus' story is that he was very clear on why he was here and what his purpose was. And he wanted to make sure that all of us, even to today, not just in the time of when he was on earth, but even today that we would never confuse religion with relationship, that we would never confuse laws and regulations and traditions with the authentic relationship of having a relationship with your creator. And so he wanted to make sure that that was a clear message. And so today we continue to share that. So last week in week number one, I'm sure you all remember the message and I'm sure that it's all fresh in your mind. We talked about Abandoning judgment and adopting. Oh, yes. First service, crickets. Crickets. Now, actually, in the first service, I had a guy take a guess who wasn't even here last week, and he got the answer right. So I gave him a lot of credit for that. So last week, we talked about abandoning judgment and adopting. One more time. We talked about abandoning judgment and adopting. All right, so that was last week. We talked about how uh, the Pharisees, who were these religious leaders that, that ultimately kept raising the bar, right? They kept raising the bar of making stuff up, to be honest with you. They kept raising the bar of regulations and rules and traditions that had nothing to do with the story of God. They just kept adding more and more and more laws. And they raised the bar so high that they ultimately they were the only ones who even knew what the laws were. And then not only that, they were the only. Now they became the people that were superior and uh, and superior and had the spiritual authority that they made everyone else feel terrible about themselves. And so everybody who was down here, they just constantly made them feel bad, and 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 constantly reminded them that they were nowhere near the presence of God and they were so far from God. And so Jesus came into this story and said, "Listen, guys, first of all, you're making a bunch of stuff up." And it was never intended to, the, the guidance and directions that I gave you in the Ten Commandments were never intended to become laws. They were, they were guidance. They were, it was a direction so that we can have a relationship with God. And then he also said that we're all short of that glory of God. And that God and the story of Jesus Christ was, came to fill that gap of wherever we're at. And so that was last week. And today we are, are stepping into hypocrisy. And it's rejecting hypocrisy. And so today what I want you to remember is that we want to reject hypocrisy and we want to be honest with ourselves. We want to reject hypocrisy and we want to be honest with ourselves. We want to reject hypocrisy and be honest with. So next week when I ask you, 
All right, so next week when I ask you, abandoning judgment and adopting? Rejected hypocrisy and being honest with? All right, you got it. You're starting to learn. You're starting to learn. All right, so that's what we want to dive into. So I'll, I'll start with myself. Since we're, I'm asking you to be honest with yourself, I'll start with being honest with myself. So areas in my life where I find myself being hypocritical, there's a lot of them. But I'm just going to narrow it down because we, you know, we only want to speak for two hours today. And so, so there's a lot of them. And so I'm just going to narrow it down to a few areas that I find myself being hypocritical, meaning expecting from someone else things that I don't do myself. One of them is driving. So when I drive, I am high on the list of hypocritical because I expect everybody on the road, in front of me mainly, I don't really care about anybody behind me, in front of me mainly, I expect everybody on the road to know what you're doing, okay? Know what you're doing. See, people feel my pain. Know what you're doing. Know where you're going. If you get into a vehicle and now you've turned this vehicle on, and you're now on the road, and you're a danger to society, okay, you're a danger to society, my expectation, not that I'm the DMV, but if I was the DMV, is here's your license. Know what you're doing. Know where you're going. All right? All right. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you. (laughs) And so whenever I get behind a driver who doesn't know what they're doing and doesn't know where they're going, my blood starts to boil. And I'm just like, why, Lord? Why must you test me with so much patience in my life? And so sure enough, like it's it's a it's a part that aggravates me, right? Unless, unless it's me that I don't know where I'm going. If I don't know where I'm going, then I expect the car behind me to have grace, (laughs) to have patience, to have mercy. But if it's a car in front of me, that really, really bugs me. And the other thing that bugs me about drivers, I'm just going to just air it out in case you ever decide to drive in front of me. The other thing that, drives, that bugs me about drivers is that when I'm on the freeway and there's three lanes, oh, yeah, see, you know. You know where I'm going with this. There's three lanes, and there's three cars in front of you, and everyone's driving 67 miles an hour. It's like, Why? Why would all three of you decide to drive 67 miles an hour and block the entire freeway? Why not all of you just get into one lane and drive 67 miles an hour with all your friends and let the rest of us who want to go 68, 69, 70, 71, maybe 80, go a little faster? So once again, a lot of hypocrisy in my heart that I'm praying for God to work through and to help me through. That's just one area, driving. The other area in my life that I find myself being hypocritical is parenting. I expect things from my kids that I don't do myself. I expect them to do things that I know is good for them. And it's also good for me, but I just want them to do it, and I don't really want to do it. It's like for one of them, I have, junior, I have a junior higher who's has more work than my two high schoolers, but I have three boys. I have a junior high boy and a, and a two high school boys. And I expect them to go to bed at a, at a reasonable hour, 9.30, 10 o'clock, 10.30 at most, if it's the weekend. And I want them to go to bed and get rest. And I tell them, your body needs rest, dude. You need to shut it down. Like you're running, you know, you're running hard all week. You're going to school. You're doing homework. You're doing sports. You're training. Uh, you, like you need to shut it down. And we are best when we, say it again, we are best when we, see, you agree with me. And so I tell them these great stories about how great their bodies will operate when they rest and how great their minds will be, how much better children they will be, how much more their parents will love them when they rest. I tell them all these great things, and then I convince them to go to bed. Then you know what I do once they go to bed? I watch two movies till 2 a.m., and I'm just like, why don't I take my own advice? It's good advice. Why don't I listen to it, right? So there's a lot of areas in my life where I find myself being hypocritical, where I, I find myself expecting things from others that I myself am I not, I'm not holding my own standard to. And during the, my days of youth, which is a long time ago, but during my days of youth, there was this really popular uh, acronyms that were going around. It was, called, it was WWJD. Oh, see, if you're laughing, you already gave away your age, just so you know. So WWJD, whether you were, whether you were a Christian or not, like even my non-Christian friends knew what WWJD was. And WWJD was, what would 
Jesus do, right? What would Jesus do? So it was like this bracelet, and it was a shirt, and it was a sticker, and it was like, what would Jesus do? And what that was is a constant reminder of, hey, if you find yourself in a situation where you need to make a decision, what would Jesus do? If you find yourself in a crossroads and you got to make a decision, what would Jesus do, right? So that's what the purpose of that was. Today, today I want to I want to change that a little bit. Today I want to change it from WWJD, which is still a good story and a good still a good acronym. But today I want to I want you to walk away with WWWD. What would Jesus undo? What would Jesus undo in your life today? If you were to dig into yourself, okay, if we were going to reject hypocrisy and look into ourselves, and you start looking into your thoughts, you start looking into your decisions, you start looking into your lifestyle, you start looking into your words, you start looking into how you view others, you start looking into your beliefs, you start looking into your story, what would Jesus undo? What would Jesus undo in the way you live life? What would Jesus undo in the way you think of others? What would Jesus undo in the way you think of yourself? What would Jesus undo in your social media? What would Jesus undo in how you approach your career and your job every day? What would Jesus undo in the way you approach your family, your marriage, your kids? What would he undo? And so that's what I want you to dig into today. What would Jesus undo in your life? And there's a story in the book of Matthew Chapter 7, verse 3 into 5. And this story is, is really Jesus hammering. I mean, being aggressive with Pharisees because Pharisees were these religious leaders that we learned last week. That's okay. That's okay, Ricky. That's all right. So if Pharisees were these religious leaders who constantly, constantly were holding people to standards that they themselves were not living. They were constantly raising the bar in people's lives and expecting them to be kinder and more holy and more righteous and more gracious and more merciful. And we're constantly raising and raising and raising the bar. And they themselves were not living to that expectation. So this, so this is where Jesus really gets upset because he had religious leaders, people, who were making other people feel bad about themselves. Who were, who were being hypocritical and making them feel terrible about their lifestyle and the way they thought and the way they acted and the way they, 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 they lived life. And so they kept raising the bar and saying, you are terrible, you're not doing this, and you're not thinking the right way, and you're not being gracious, and you're not holy, and you're not, and you're not righteous. And they kept raising the bar, making people feel terrible about yourself. And there's one thing you need to understand about Jesus is he's got zero tolerance for when we make his children feel terrible about themselves. Zero tolerance. He does not like when people make other people feel bad about themselves. He has zero tolerance when people make other people feel terrible about themselves. When people tell other people how terrible they are. He has zero tolerance for that. Zero tolerance. So here he was in the book of Matthew chapter 7, uh, seven verses 3 through 5, talking to these Pharisees, saying, And why are you worrying about the speck in your friend's eye? When you have a gigantic log in your own eye. So basically saying, why are you worrying about the, the, the small stick in your friend's eye when there's a gigantic tree trunk in your own eye? He's saying, how can you think of saying to your friend, hey, friend, let me help you with that stick in your eye when you can't even see past the gigantic log in your own eye? And he uses this word hypocrite. He says, hypocrite. First get rid of the gigantic tree trunk in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. And so this was Jesus not being very patient with someone who was constantly making other people feel terrible about themselves. And even worse, someone who was holding someone else accountable or expected for them to behave a certain way when they themselves were not living that way. And he had zero tolerance, and he uses this word hypocrite. Now, hypocrite, I, I might have shared this with you before, but, you know, obviously your memory is really great. This was several months ago. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. What is this? Hypocrisy is derived from a Greek word that describes actors who would switch from various masks to play different characters. So this is where the word hypocrisy came from. Hypocrisy was, was intended to use as a description of when someone would perform in a play, 
they would communicate to the audience that, hey, I'm, although my name is Moses Camacho, I'm going to come out on stage as an actor. And I'm going to come out on stage and pretend to be someone else. So I'm really not Moses Camacho. I am going to pretend and act and give an illustration or demonstration of someone else. I'm going to pretend to be a different character. But when I take the mask off and I step off stage, my name is Moses Camacho. I'm a father of three. I have a family. I like sports. Sports don't like me. My teams are terrible. I'm obviously loyal because I don't let them go. And so obviously, so when I take the mask off, I show who Moses Camacho is. But the purpose of the word hypocrisy was to illustrate that there was an actor on stage, that there was an actor on stage. Now, the story with Jesus was that hypocrisy became a part of people's day-to-day life. They were no longer, it was no longer just a word for actors on stage. It was now being a word that people would use in their day-to-day life and pretend to be someone they're not. And then not only that, you had religious people who kept raising the bar, saying they were holy, saying they were righteous, saying that they had it all right together, and would make other people feel terrible for not having it all together. And so now Jesus is really irked by this. He's really irked by this. And he also shares that there's a danger. There's a danger when we walk around pretending to be something that we're not. There's a danger when we walk around giving the illustration or the presentation that we are really someone else when we really are not. And there's a danger behind that. And one of the dangers is that if you live behind the mask long enough, eventually you start to believe your own lies. That if you live, that the danger behind hiding behind a mask is if you hide behind it long enough, eventually you don't even realize you're lying to yourself. And then when you don't realize you're lying to yourself, you become this person who is pretend, who is hiding behind a mask. And you don't even know who you are anymore. And you've been so worked up on your social media and making sure you present this lifestyle that really isn't there. And that all of a sudden you start to believe this is your life. And yet there's a lot of brokenness in your relationships, a lot of brokenness in your heart, a lot of brokenness in your peace, a lot of brokenness in how you operate with others and what you hold other people accountable to. So what is hypocrisy and what is hypocrisy not? So let me tell you what hypocrisy is not. Hypocrisy is not the disparity between what we do and what we wish we did. Hypocrisy is not the disparity of what we do and what we wish we did. For example, if I say, man, if I say, I mean, I wish I didn't have terrible thoughts, but yet I have bad thoughts, that's not hypocrisy. That's just me being sinful. If I wish I didn't have terrible thoughts or if I wish I didn't struggle with anger, but yet I struggle with anger, and me realizing that, that's not hypocrisy. That's me being, that's me just being uh, struggling with sin. What is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is the gap between what we show and who we are. The, The gap between what we show and who we are. So in the WWUD, what would Jesus undo? What is it that Jesus was constantly trying to undo in the Pharisees? What is it that Jesus is constantly trying to do in us? He's trying to undo the show. He's saying, put the show away. You're you're not fooling anyone for starters. And not only on top of that, you're making your life a lot harder because you're trying to be someone you're really not. And you're trying to be accepted or you're trying to uh, make a difference or you're trying to, you're try- whatever it is you're trying to do, it's not working. And then when you're trying to live up to a show and trying to be someone you're not, you're hurting yourself in this entire process. And so what would he undo? He would undo the show. The Pharisees put on masks not to, not to do the right things, but to present the right things. The Pharisees would put on masks not because they were wanted to do the right things. They wanted to make it look like they were doing the right things. And so Jesus gives this really graphic, detailed story in the book of Luke. And he he paints two pictures of two completely different people. And, 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 And there's really no better way for me to describe what type of person 
God really wants us all to be than this story. And it's found in the book of Luke, chapter 18. And he gives two different illustrations. One illustration is an illustration of a Pharisee, someone who was someone who lived the life behind a mask, pretending to be someone they weren't, putting on a show, wanting everyone to believe certain things about them. And then the other person that he gives in this illustration is a person who was broken and who knew they were broken and asked God to accept his brokenness, and to fill in the gap of his brokenness. So here's the story. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, it says, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness. I love the certain words he uses. Who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Once again, this is what Jesus did not like about Pharisees. Would put on a show, make other people feel terrible about themselves, and then they themselves were not even holding themselves to that standard. So, a great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. He says, Two men went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. So, if you're a tax collector in today's day, you know, God bless you. You're doing the best you can. But in those days, tax collectors were considered, tax collectors were considered like the optimal sinners. So in, in those days, tax collectors would take advantage of people. Um, it was, it, I, I'm sorry, it, it's, this, it's, that has nothing to do if you work for a bank. If you're, you know, it, it, but I'm just, in those days, a tax collector would take advantage of people, would collect, would raise taxes, and, you know, ultimately take advantage of people. So when he uses the illustration of tax collector, he's trying to give the two differences. He's trying to give a Pharisee who's supposed to be super religious and super close to God, and is trying to give the example of a, of a sinner, okay? So someone who was broken and had taken advantage of others, all right? So, two, uh, so here we go. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like the other people. They're cheaters. They're sinners. They're adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not to even to lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed instead. He, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you this, the sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So here in this illustration, you see that God paints the picture of two completely different approaches to how to live life. One guy was a Pharisee, like, oh my gosh, thank you for not letting me be as a, you know, a sinner like the person here next to me, and I'm so great, and I go to church, and I, do, and I give, and I, and I do everything that, uh, that I should, and I'm not like this person, like, oh, thank you, God, for letting me, letting me be so great. And then the person that was next to him was saying, man, I can't even lift my head. I am so filled with shame and guilt. I'm, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for being a sinner. I, I, please forgive me. I know I don't have it all together. I just, I just want to say, let me have forgiveness and still be in your presence. And so what Jesus is saying is like between these two illustrations, the one that accepted his brokenness and the one that was honest about them themselves is the one that's going to have a relationship and a closeness to God. But the one that's hiding behind a mask, pretending he or she has it all together, and making others feel terrible about themselves, you are going to be so distant from God, you're never going to even hear his voice because you're not even allowing yourself to put your guard down to even hear God's voice. And so a phrase that I, you know, I just have come to accept is I'd rather be an honest sinner than a lying hypocrite. I would rather be an honest sinner, being honest with my brokenness, honest with my faults, honest with my failures, than being a lying hypocrite, holding myself and others to a standard that I myself can't even, can even uphold. And here's what I've come to understand, is that Jesus has zero tolerance for hypocrisy, but unlimited grace for a sinner who desires forgiveness. Jesus has zero, zero tolerance for people who are pretending like they have it all together and making other people feel bad and terrible for it. Zero tolerance for that. But he has unlimited grace for a sinner who actually desires forgiveness. So Jesus is saying, listen, I don't care if you are, your, your sin is this big of a gap. 
I don't care if your sin is this big of a gap. I don't care if your sin is this big of a gap. This, I really don't even care if your sin is all the way down to the ground. The love and mercy and the story of Jesus can fill this gap no matter where you are in your journey. There is no gap too large, too big, too distant that Jesus himself cannot fill. Whether you are here, 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 no matter what your gap is, Jesus' love and mercy can fill that gap. But we got to be honest with ourselves. And we got to understand that we need the grace and the love of, of Jesus to fill that gap. Because no matter what we do, we will never, never be perfect enough to fill the gap ourselves. We will never, ever, ever have our own wisdom, strength, experience, story to fill the gap ourselves. We will always, always need the grace and love of Jesus to fill the gap in our life. And so Jesus says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out everything in, my, in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. So as we get ready to close, we reject hypocrisy by being honest with ourselves. We reject hypocrisy by being honest with ourselves. And Psalms chapter 139 says this, search me. Don't search my neighbor. Don't search my friend. Don't point out the faults in, my, in the people around me. God, search my heart first. Search me, O God, and know my heart Test me and know my anxious thoughts. This is point out anything in me, anything in me that offends you, anything in me that creates a distance between you and I. Point that out, God, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. What I walk away from this scripture and understand here is that you are only as strong as you are honest. You're only going to be as strong as you are honest with yourself. The examples that Jesus used between the Pharisee and the, and the tax collector, he found more strength in the tax collector because the tax collector was being real and was being honest with himself and was, was, was admitting his faults and his failures and his brokenness and asking for God's grace and mercy. And what Jesus is saying is that person is going to have more strength and a, close, and a closeness to, uh, to me Versus the person who's pretending that they have it all together and doesn't even realize that there's a gap that they're not even allowing me to fill. And so as we get ready to close, I want to just pray for the, for the people in the room right now that have come to understand that you've been hiding behind a mask. For one, no one's even asking you. No one's even asking you to put up a mask. No one's even asking you to live behind a mask. But you somehow, some way, have arrived to a place where you f have felt like you needed to live behind a mask. I don't know if it's because you wanted to be accepted. I don't know if it's because you wanted to be included. I don't know if it's because you wanted people to hold you to a standard that you yourself weren't holding yourself to. But whatever that reason is, I'm here today to let you know you don't need to do that. And not only that, it keeps you from a closeness and an authenticity and a relationship with God that hiding behind an ask will never allow you to have. And it will free you. You'll be able to walk around with freedom knowing that you're not holding yourself to standards that are unrealistic anymore. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to be able to pray for you. And I know that the Holy Spirit has been moving today, and I know the Holy Spirit has been talking to you. Here's the, the beauty and the power in the Holy Spirit. The beauty and the power in the Holy Spirit is that somehow, some way, God has the power to have individual conversations with everybody in the room. God has this amazing ability to have a direct conversation with you specifically about your life at the same exact time that he's having a conversation with the person next to you. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to pray for you today. I want to give you, I want to ask you to put down the, the mask. And I want you to accept the love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ to fill that gap in your life. But before I do that, the first step I want to give is give you the opportunity to accept Jesus in your heart. And if you have not taken that first step of letting Jesus 
be in your life and be in your heart, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Whether it's for the first time, or whether maybe you got some distance and Jesus has not been a part of your life and now you're recommitting your life to Christ, I want to give you that opportunity right now. All I want to do is have you make eye contact with me and raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for. So is there anybody in the room that would like to have Christ in their heart, whether it's the first time or if this is a recommitment, just make eye contact with me and raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for. God bless you. Thank you for raising your hand. God bless you. Thank you for raising your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I see you back there. Thank you so much. So brave. I'm so proud, and and I'm so proud of you, and this is so brave of you to take such an amazing step to letting Christ be in your heart and in your life. And now still with every head bowed and every eye closed, this is for everybody in the room. As if you were here, as you were listening to this message, if you felt God through the power of the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and saying, there's an area in your life, maybe not a lot of areas, but there's at least one area in your life where you've been hiding behind a mask. And Jesus is saying, it's time to put that mask down. It's time to be real. It's time to be honest with yourself. It's time to allow the grace of Jesus and the mercy of Jesus and the love of Jesus to fill that gap. And if that is you today, if Jesus is asking you to put down the mask and let him fill your heart and your life with love, mercy, and grace, I want to pray for you today as well. Same thing, make eye contact with me and raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for. And we know we're on this journey together where you're taking this step. So if there's anybody in the room, I see you back there. Thank you. If God has asked you to put down the mask, I see you right here. Thank you. I see you right here. Thank you. I see you right here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so proud of you guys. Anyone else in the room, an area in your life, I see you right here. God bless you. Thank you. Nothing greater than putting down a mask. I see you, man. I saw you. Thank you. Putting down the mask and letting the love of Jesus fill it with love and mercy and grace. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, you saw the hands in the air go up. Lord, I am overwhelmed. I am overwhelmed with joy. I am so proud of everyone in this room who has heard your voice and has allowed you to come into their life. And Jesus, I'm asking you to fill them with love and grace and mercy. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, to be present in their lives because they want to be connected to you. They want to hear your voice. And they want to be freed from whatever mass they were living and putting, living behind and putting themselves to. God, free them. Give them love. Give them mercy. Give them grace like only you know how to do. We say these things in your name. Amen. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that He's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because a Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that He can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.